Okay, this is uh, Bob Dennis once again talking to Aaron Coffey about subjects uh, all around and related to PEMF and the use of uh, ICES PEMF technology that, that I developed over the last 10 or 15 years. And um, just want to say that, you know, in my opinion, Aaron has had uh, so many good ideas that somebody needs to record them for posterity. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing here. And so, Aaron, take it away. All right. Thanks, Dr. Dennis. So uh, I just want to say on the onset, I didn't discuss this last time, but um, <clears throat> I, uh, not a doctor, I might have said that, but I'm not a doctor, not a physician in any sense, not a clinician, um, not a professional at all. I'm not a marketer. I'm not an affiliate for anybody. I don't make a dime for saying what I'm saying. It's just my free opinion. I, it's sort of a personal mission because I was once someone who was just so confused and feeling sick and wanting to be well, which I kind of discussed last time. And uh, when I got better or as I continue to get better, I want to be able to share that with other people who I know are going through the same types of things. So I found Dr. Dennis and I, and I personally think he has a heart that's similar to mine. So I said, all right, well, I'd like to, he, when he mentioned, Hey, would you, uh, are you, do you have a blog? Do you have a website? And I was like, no, I don't. I'm uh, you know, I'm an extroverted type person, but digitally I'm more of a recluse. So I, uh, we talked about maybe going on YouTube and that's when I decided okay, this will be the first time, and that was Friday. This is the first time I've been on YouTube. <laughs> I've discussed yeah. it personally with a lot of people, but I've never actually, um, I had not thought about broadcasting what I'd done because I didn't think anybody frankly cared. And, uh, and I think more people care than I realized, uh, <laughs> partially based on Friday and partially based on friends and family who've given me good feedback. So I just kind of want to continue what I started. Well, this is good. Let me just do a quick disclaimer, too, since we're starting off on these, because I think we're going to have a number of conversations that we'll put on YouTube. Hopefully, they'll be interesting to people. Um, first of all, I can tell Aaron without, you know, categorically that what he has to say is very interesting. I have hundreds of people asking me these questions, and Aaron has answers to them um, that I think he should share with people. So that's what this is all about. So Aaron makes zero money. We have no financial relationship whatsoever. Uh, he's doing this out of the good of his heart. He uh, is just trying to help people. It's a hard. I like I like talking to him, you know, because that's what he's trying to do. Now, from my point, you know, from my angle, I own a company and I make MicroPulse, ESPMF, but uh, it's just me and my wife. Um, we charge enough just to make the company fiscally, you know, viable. We charge just enough to be able to continue to produce these for people. Uh, we do all the engineering, design, scientific research, and everything, you know, and, and put as much value as we can in every product. You know, I finish building each and every one of them by hand with the intention of helping someone with each and every one. And I have nothing to do with the sales. So I don't even know what some of our products cost. I know approximately, probably within 25, 30 bucks or something like that. But there's, there's really not like a, there's no marketing, there's no multi-level, anything in this. Like every dime that you spend on that either goes to supporting our company so that we can do it viably, you know, or well, pretty much that's it. We don't spend any money on anything else. And and because it's my mission, you know, I got I got shot out the back end of the uh, medical system when I had terrible disabling chronic pain. They couldn't do anything but hand me a bottle of opioids. And then... Uh, I had to do something. So I just want to share with the world what I've been able to figure out as a scientist. And I am not a doctor either, right? So I'm just trying to share what I think as a scientist. And so really what you're hearing from, from me and Aaron is it's a conversation between two guys that are, are not financially motivated. We're just trying to help people. Yeah, that's exactly where I was at. And uh, I've been looking for people like that along the way and I found people like that along the way and you're one of them. Um, others maybe not have a YouTube channel or something like that, but they're still, whether they're doctors or whether they're just, uh, I don't know if they're self hackers, but a lot of them have just been doctor friends or chiropractor friends or osteopath friends who, who genuinely had the same desire and that might be their actual business. But I know a lot of people that um, if they could just help people all the time, they would. I frankly think that there are some people out there like that. There really, there really are. The more I talk to people, I've talked to several thousand people since I started doing this. So I have a pretty big friends list. And uh, yeah. most people are pretty good. Most people are genuinely trying to be helpful. You do run into the occasional bad person 
but uh, I know I know one person who's I won't name him because he hasn't given me permission to. But he's the second largest landowner in the state of North Carolina. He just sold a small piece of land and turned it into an 18-fold golf course or something here in wow. in, in the North Carolina mountains. And uh, you know he's that kind of person. I mean, he's he owns a big enough piece of property in Hawaii that you can actually see his property from the space station. <laughs> so, so he's a pretty wealthy person, and and he's he's contacted me too about this day. He's a really nice guy too. I wish I could, maybe I'll have him on sometime. Um, but basically he told me that all he wants to do is help people. Right. And, and to do it, which is really good. We don't take any money from him or anything. And he's, he's just trying to help him. He recommends it to people. He said, basically his goal in life is to be able to walk down the street, see somebody who needs something and be able to just help them. I mean, he's like a sort of the archetypal definition of a good Samaritan. He's, he's a really good guy, you know? So most people are pretty good in my experience. That's awesome. Yeah. Maybe I'm lucky, right? But <laughs> I don't think most people to be good. I just feel like they just, they may not know. I don't think they would know what we have, dis what I think I have discovered with this device to be able to do. I mean, they have, they know a lot of really good things and they're great things. They're, you know, maybe turmeric, curcumin, variations of that, you know, just extracts of something that are really powerful, but this is unbelievably powerful and it has helped me a whole lot faster than a lot of other things that I've done. Well, see, the thing is that actually, Aaron, the, even though I developed the device, I've been doing research on it, I'm actively researching it now. I think the odds are pretty good that you know more about the, the range of things that it can do than I know. Because, and, and I think that's true because you've talked to a lot of people and you've done a lot of experiments. Whereas my usage of the device and my experience is pretty narrow. It's kind of like wound and injury healing and chronic pain and inflammation. That's what I kind of know a fair amount about. But as soon as I go outside of that range, I, I feel somewhat disingenuous telling anybody anything because I don't have personal experience and I haven't really done a lot of experiments on it. So there's not much I can say, unfortunately. But people like you keep telling me, wow, it works for this and that and the other thing. Yeah. So, well, that's you know. why when you mentioned YouTube, uh, and this is me speaking to the audience, Dr. Dennis and I kind of want to do a series of like firecracker lectures, if you were, firecracker conversations, just pow, 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 a uh, bunch of uh, little ones, because I, I'll just speak frankly, I have a tendency to, to talk a long period of time. Dr. Dennis and his wife both know that. I would call him up on the phone and talk for two hours. And I would boxes, so, so we talk for a long time on the phone. Yeah, we do. And anybody that knows me that's watching this video can could definitely affirm that both in the comments and personally. So I have to work hard to condense it because uh, length of uh, speech is not a, ever a problem for me. So well, what do you not, think would... I'm sorry for interrupting you, Aaron. What do you, what do you think, to, to sort of kick it off, what do you think people should know that would be most helpful? Well, I have a, uh, a theory that I have developed based on science and experiments, and I'll say what it is, but then I'll tell you kind of how I got there, and then maybe in the next video, we can just spend the entire video, you know, 20 minutes or something, just talking about what it is, the methodology itself, and, and all the things that I've done with it, perhaps. Um, but for the remainder of this time, maybe, um, one thing I can tell you is that um, I, if you wanted to get where I got and how I got there, um, I'll give you a series of authors and we can, you know, you can YouTube them yourself because a lot of this information is on Amazon or YouTube. So it's not anything where I went to someone and I stole a trade secret or something like that. It's nothing like that where it's, I basically read a book and then took what I learned from the book with something else I learned over here and kind of put it together and kind of made a working theory about it. And it just kept continuing to evolve into me experimenting and saying, whoopsie, wow, uh, that was extremely powerful and effective. And was that a placebo? Okay, well, let's try it again. Oh, this is not a placebo. Let's just keep trying it and trying it. And so what I've done is um, the inverse piezoelectric effect. So people know piezoelectricity. You might be able to talk to it better than me because you're a scientist and I'm, a, I'm not. And uh, But I know that a lot of people understand like crystal radios and things like that. And and a lot of our electronic technology is based on piezo or piezo electricity. So what that means is that piezo electricity is the way that nature couples like forces, like a pressure, piezo pressure, and electricity, a voltage. So some crystals and some other substances, when you apply pressure, you get a voltage. And it turns out that there's, there are biological substances that do that, that are known to do that, like, for example, collagen. I read a couple of government studies or abstracts of government studies would be a better way to put it that 
mentioned bone, collagen, and there's one specific crystalline type structure that's in the body too. Uh, I don't know if it's in the bone or if it's the collagen. I, it might start with an H, but I'm not exactly. Hyaline, right. hyaline cartilage, probably. Something like that. I read about yeah. it. I tried to review last night too, because I was just kind of curious what it was. But well, it was I used, I used to, oh, just so people know, I used to teach a course at University of Michigan for many years on uh, biomaterials and tissues. And I still teach a tissue engineering course at UNC. So I can tell you there's, there used to be in the 1960s and 70s, there was a pretty big literature on, on bio piezoelectricity. And, and many of the papers you've read about probably come from them from then, uh, roughly about then, late 60s, early 70s. And there was a lot of work done and all of a sudden it stopped. And I don't know why. Well, that's intriguing. Well, I, I know that I, uh, I guess specifically with MicroPulse, I won't go all the way back to, you know, when I first started with all stuff, I kind of did that last Friday. But uh, one of the things I could talk about is that when I first learned about MicroPulse, I saw Dr. Bill Pollack's work and I went to his website because he had a lot of great literature posted on PEMF and all it can do in the wide ranges of it. So I went to YouTube and I watched a whole bunch of videos by him about basically what it could or couldn't done and had or hadn't been proven to do. And there's a lot of really amazing things that it could do for your eyes and for your bones and for your body. And I thought, wow, this is a very wide and it's like a whole new field, basically. It's not like a subset of another field. It's just a brand new field. And he had a lot of great, easy to understand articles for the guy who was just coming along into that field like myself. You know, you know, <clears throat> actually, I've, I've sort of counted up the number of uh, conditions that PEMF seems to be effective for. Mm -hmm. It seems to have some positive biological effect. And it's a really large number. It's, it's several hundred. And I don't know if you know this, but <clears throat> currently there's about 7,000 known disease conditions and injury conditions for humans. And we only have treatments for about 500 of them. I have heard that. Right. I so so that. that's about right. And and P and uh, PEMF seems to be effective for a whole different subset. So it seems to have some kind of activity that's different than like a chemical that you can eat, like a drug or something like that. Mm -hmm. So and and it's several hundred things, and it doesn't really necessarily overlap with what you can do with drugs. So the way I think of PEMF is, I actually think of it as the other half of medicine. I think of it as this this like we talked about this last time. For 100 years, we've completely neglected the non-chemical half of medicine, which is the sort of electromagnetic half of the way that our body responds. And, all, and some people, even scientists, will say, well, there's no evidence that electromagnetism does anything to the body, which is nonsense. Because we all know, you, you, know, you know, like a high school experiment, you can, you can take a, you know, a little bit of electricity, make muscles contract, and nerves, propagation that's electromechanical, and and it's very well known now from quantum effects and from, you know, different things that go on in the physiology of, you know, different types of animals, birds, whales, turtles, and things like that, and some mammals. There's a response to electromagnetism. And if you go outside in the sunlight, okay, your body makes vitamins because of electromagnetic radiation from the sun, right? UV rays, right? Your body responds to heat, which is electromagnetic radiation in the infrared range. So your body has a response to all kinds of areas in the electromagnetic spectrum that are very positive. There's no reason, all that I'm saying, and I think the only thing that the whole literature tells you is, well, there's one more that we just haven't looked at yet, and that's PEMF. And it just happens to seem to be extremely powerful and effective based on my experimentation and conclusions in the last couple months at least. Um, and so I was thinking, um, when I found Dr. Um, Dr. Pollock's re research and I started looking at all that, I also noticed uh, Dr. Roth's, George Roth's research. He's a Canadian, uh, I believe, chiropractor. But yep. it seems, I read his book. I bought it on Amazon. It's a great book. It's like $20. highly recommend anyone read it. And I think he sold that book before the PEMF technology was out. But it's a really fascinating approach to, I think, using bioelectricity specifically found in more so the palm of your hands to help um, to help basically restore health in the body. As an example, it's kind of, I looked at it and said, this is like a combination of osteopathy, chiropractic, and uh, massage release techniques. And then there's like, a, he talked about the tensegrity theory, which was not well adopted, but it was, it was actually published information, I believe, from Harvard on the body being a 
structure that is basically woven together with the fascia, it's all one, basically it's all one piece. So if people are not like geeking along with me, the body is one piece of fabric. And he had this great illustration on YouTube uh, and other people that have been trained by him did too, that if you pulled, uh, if you pulled like your clothing at your waist, um, you're actually going to feel the restriction at another point of your body, but the actual tear or the actual injury or whatever may be clear across the other side of the body. And I found that to be extremely helpful and uh, thinking about like how I was trying to help my own self. So I was like, all right, well, before I stumbled into what I stumbled in, it was like I picked pieces from every different location, kind of mixed in with some of that piezoelectricity theory. So I really, I guess you could summarize by saying piezoelectricity and the tensegrity theory. If people want to go out there and YouTube it, I highly recommend you jump into learning some basic understanding of piezoelectricity, piezoelectricity, and uh, the tensegrity theory, the body being a single piece of fabric. And then kind of imagine what it would be like if you were to do the opposite of what piezoelectricity is. Because piezoelectricity is basically the idea that if I, um, I think it's if I electrify, it will vibrate. But the reverse of that is if I squeeze, it generates electricity, unless I just got it backwards. Well, it actually works both ways. That's the thing, you know, so you can put electric field on something and it'll change dimensions. Mm -hmm. And then you can change the dimensions and it generates an electric uh, field. It's fascinating. Right. So I was going to say, maybe we could put a, you know, if you have some links that you'd like to send people to, well, I'll try to write them in down below and you can just click on them and look them. And I was going to say, tensegrity sounds, it's hard to spell, but it sounds like it's some sort of exotic thing, but it's not. It's yeah. the, it's, it's, it's very intuitive, right? Like when you put up a tent and, yeah. and the tent is stable, it's stable because of tensegrity. Mm -hmm. So tensegrity is just the idea a structure can be stable because of the interaction of different uh, elements in tension and some in compression sometimes um, to make it stable. And, and tensegrity definitely, definitely works in the body at many different hierarchical levels, right? At the highest level, you've got skin pulling everything in. And if you had nothing else pushing out like your bones, you'd be a sphere, right? You'd be a sphere, spherical because, you know, just surface tension in and it'll minimize its area surface area but then we have bones projecting out and they're usually in uh, compression so at the highest level you know our shape shape of our body is because of tensegrity between the skin and stuff that's inside of you and then you can keep bringing it down and it's true within organ systems like in muscle and tendon systems you have tensegrity between muscle tendon bone and ligament and uh, and you can go all the way in cartilage and you can go all the way down to individual cells and even the shape of individual cells is largely due to tensegrity because of the, uh, the tension of the, the cell membrane and microtubules inside the cell and everything. So, and there's some evidence too. There's actually pretty good evidence. And I, I think it was put forward by Don Ingber, who was the person at Harvard you were talking about. Yeah, I, think, I think it was Don Ingber who, uh, um, had had pointed out that tensegrity, like if you if you change the the shape of a cell by poking at it with like a micro poker, like a little glass poker, because of tensegrity, it actually causes tension that goes through the nuclear membrane and changes gene expression. So there's people down at that level on tensegrity. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot to that. Why well, started that? Right? nearly that deep, not as a biomedical engineer. Well, you know, that's, that's what I do, right? I mean, that's, I'm supposed to know these things, right? I'm glad you do. Um, so I, I think even tensegrity might be a made up word of tension and integrity, like structural integrity. and. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's made up and it may have, it was made up probably by the first person who started publishing it, who I believe was Don Ingber, but I could be wrong. Sorry, Don, if it's, if I'm referring to the wrong person, but it's, um, um, something that was very big in tissue engineering and cell biology about 20 years ago because we were all trying to figure out, you know, what controls gene expression. And, you know, it's chemical things. It's all kinds of things, you know, um, electromagnetic fields and, and, and mechanical stimuli. So tensegrity definitely can transfer mechanical stimulus from the outside of the cell through the nuclear membrane and into genetic material and change the expression of genes. 
Well, I think and, uh, uh, before I show them like what I've actually done, because I'm not trying to build to this, I just don't want it to sound nonsensical, which is why I'm trying to discuss kind of what I've done before I get to that point. So it doesn't sound so crazy. <laughs> How did I well, get there? You know, it's it's the thing is, yeah, you know, um, some of this is, is pretty much empirical, right? In yeah. my opinion. And and it, it may be intense agree, it may be piezo electricity. And I can think of about five or six other, other mechanisms that it might be. But but to be just completely, you know, honest with you, I think when somebody does really do an experiment and categorically show and figure out exactly how PEMF is transduced by the body, how cells and tissues sense it, and how they pick up that signal and then they do something with it biologically. So when you know the nuts and bolts about the molecules, which is all the biophysics, when that gets figured out, I'm, I'm pretty confident that person is going to get a Nobel Prize. I think there's one, it's, it's a kind of a complicated problem, right? I mean, I've been poking at it for decades and I'm not super smart, so I'm never going to get a Nobel Prize, but I think some really smart person is going to figure this out and, and they're probably going to get a Nobel Prize for it because I think from what I can see, I keep staring through the bars of my own limitations. There, there really are some very subtle and complex and rich and deep biophysical questions that we have about how cells and tissues work. We just don't know the answer to. And I think EMF, the mechanisms are going to tell us something about that. I can't wait till that day. Hopefully it's within my yeah. life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'd love to know, but uh, you know, and I'm trying, I'm working on it. I'm working with some people who've done some cell patch clamping and looking at cell membranes and stuff and trying to figure out if there's, you know, cause I come at this from two angles, right? One purely practical empirical, work for back pain that's my question can it reduce crippling pain but then i also come at it from the other angle which is okay what's the biophysics of pemf i'll tell you it's slow going it's very slow going because number one there's very few people who work on it because it's stigmatized they think you're a complete kook yeah. you know, and i'm maybe i'm a kook right opinions vary depends on who you ask well, but you're a kook, um, i feel a lot healthier now for your kookiness than i did before i started using the device that's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> and that's what matters, right? And it's also, I think it's op it's really nice and would be really helpful, but it's optional at this point to know yeah. exactly what biophysics are. It, it would be really nice and helpful and make help me make even more effective devices. But it's not necessary to get to the point where you can help people. Well, I can think of one more thing before we can uh, maybe uh, prepare to talk about more information at a later time. Um, sure. I remember uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I don't even think I've told you this, but this is sort of one of the, the, the day that I stumbled upon this, what led up to me trying this was basically, I remember as a teenager, I'd read like future science type stuff or popular mechanics or, you know, just before the internet was uh, high speed enough to want to sit there and, you know, be able to watch right. it. Like that. I'm sitting there, oh, this is so painfully slow, I live in the middle of nowhere. And so, you know, I'm looking at magazines and I remember actually an internet article was really poor quality uh, as far as resolution. But I remember, I think it was Virginia Tech. This is about 20 years ago. Somebody um, st discovered some sort of polymer solution that I think they trademarked and patented called metal rubber. I don't think anybody's ever heard of this technology before, but you can find it on the internet still. It was basically a polymer where they could, um, it was rubbery like, it was moldable, which I, I was thinking about, that's kind of the body, it's flexible. But then when they applied a charge to it, it would retain a certain shape and it would become it, like it was stronger than steel. So at that time, the theory was, wow, we could sell this to, you know, aerospace or somewhere and they could create a moldable wing and electrify it and it would retain that shape. But then when they reduced the charge, it would just go back to being static again. That's, that's really interesting. Body. I, I can actually tell you some some secret government research that was done on that. Perhaps I, you know, perhaps I'll disappear after I say this, but Back about 20 years ago, I was working for DARPA, and we had a program that was the, the bio-inspired materials program that I was involved in. And one of them was based upon some natural phenomena that are like that, like the sea cucumber apparently can change its shape and change its uh, mechanical properties of its, of its structure quite rapidly. And so the military wanted to know, DARPA wanted to know, you know, can we build a material that can do exactly what Aaron just said, we just change its shape, freeze into position, and, and, you know, so you can have something that morphs into different shapes, and then, you know, it could be a boat or an airplane or whatever, same material, but it just changes its shape. And then the other half of that question is, can you have materials like that, that when you apply 
electric field to them or a magnetic field that they will actually work. They'll do work like a motor or an actuator or a solenoid. And those were called, and they, I believe they still are called, uh, electroactive polymers, EAP. Yeah. And you can look them up. Yeah, you can look them up. And I was actually on a DARPA program that was working on these things. So, you know, I've, I've, I have all these weird, you know, there's a bunch of people who are going to say, no, no way, you weren't. Well, I was, you know, just a fact. And it's quite interesting. They, they kept running into some limits. They were only, electroactive polymers were only able to get just so far. And they, they couldn't really get too far. But they were trying to have a DARPA, a DARPA-like, DARPA-esque competition where they wanted to have an arm wrestling, an arm wrestling contest with one arm built with electroactive polymers versus a human arm. And they tried that for a few years and the challenge was, it was sort of like, you know, one of these uh, uh, challenges that they have now. Can you build an arm using electroactive polymers that can win an arm wrestling contest? And I don't think they were ever quite able to do that, but I was involved in that for a while and it, it's quite interesting, you know? But the fact is that there are definitely, I mean, a taser, right? What does a taser do? You shoot somebody with a taser and they go stiff. Yeah. So, so we know, you know, I mean, they basically, uh, you know, go into like a, like a rider mus muscle, you know, full activation and that's how it works. Right. So there's, there's definitely some kind of relationship between electromagnetism and, and structural uh, integrity in the body. No that's doubt about it. Of, in my mind. That's kind of how I came upon it. And, um, I can go into more detail soon about uh, okay. exactly how I performed it and from beginning to end. Well, what do you think? Uh, I think we've, we've sort of introduced a series of talks here pretty well. Maybe we should uh, um, end this one and then uh, do some more specific talks about yeah. things that you're doing. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much. We'll see you later. And uh, Aaron and I will schedule our next talk. Okay? Thanks.